Do you believe in absolute truth? Today, we're going to challenge everything you thought you knew about the Bible, a book that has endured for millennia, sparking both heated debates and profound reverence. In this video, we'll uncover how ancient manuscripts lost to time not only affirm the authenticity of the scriptures, but also unveil secrets that could radically alter your understanding of the past and the future. Stay with us as we unravel a mystery that defies logic, strengthens faith, and promises to shift your worldview in the blink of an eye. The truth is closer than you might think, and what you're about to learn could be the most invaluable reward of your life. Are you ready to quench your curiosity? Then stick around. The Dead Sea Scrolls, ancient texts that validate the Bible's truth, have sparked discussions about changes and amendments over their lengthy history. Many regard the Bible as a sacred text and wonder if its words have remained unchanged over time. This discovery has helped historians address such inquiries. These ancient fragments, the Dead Sea Scrolls, set out to investigate whether the Bible, a compilation of ancient scriptures, has withstood the test of time without alterations. Hidden in the deserts of the earth, these millennia-old manuscripts were found by chance. But it was a discovery that soon led to astonishing conclusions. Let's delve into these ancient Jewish manuscripts from the Second Temple period, a revelation that caused a historical upheaval between 1946 and 1956. Today, they reside in the Shrine of the Book at the Israel Museum and hold unparalleled historical, religious, and linguistic significance. Their importance extends beyond mere preservation, as they include the oldest manuscripts of books later integrated into the biblical canons. This means they offer us a rare glimpse into the religious thought of Judaism at the end of the Second Temple period. Now, even as they reside in Israel, the ownership of these manuscripts is mired in controversy. These scrolls are at the heart of territorial, legal, and humanitarian debates among Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority. Yet the main focus for everyone is the content these manuscripts contain, ranging from Hebrew scriptures to non-canonical texts like the Book of Enoch. They encompass a complex amalgamation of beliefs. About 40% are copies of texts from the Hebrew scriptures, another 30% from the Second Temple period, and the remainder offers a fascinating glimpse into the rules and beliefs of specific sects within Judaism. Before we dive into the texts themselves, Let's look at how they were discovered. Their journey to daylight began with an accidental find that would reshape our understanding of the past between 1946 and 1956 in the West Bank, then under Jordanian control. Bedouin shepherds and a team of archaeologists initiated a search that would uncover 12 caves around the site initially known as Qumran, near the Dead Sea. The spark for this discovery occurred between November 1946 and February 1947, when Bedouin shepherd Muhammad Ed Dib, his cousin Juma Muhammad, and Khalil Musa stumbled upon seven scrolls hidden in jars within a cave near what we now recognize as the Qumran site. Muhammad Ed Dib, the first to enter what is now known as Cave One, retrieved scrolls including the Isaiah Scroll, the Habakkuk Commentary, and the Community Rule. Initially hung on a tent pole, these scrolls eventually found their way to a dealer named Ibrahim Iha in Bethlehem. From there, the scrolls passed through various hands. Fast forward to 2017 and 2021, when new chapters were added to the story. A 12th cave, though looted in the 1950s, was discovered in 2017, and in 2021, Israeli archaeologists unveiled dozens of fragments with biblical text, adding to the narrative of the scrolls and bringing to light a basket made 10,500 years ago. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the next step was to identify their physical characteristics to confirm their authenticity. Radiocarbon dating, a technique that measures the age of organic materials, played a crucial role in determining the approximate age of the manuscripts. 
The initial test in 1950, conducted on a piece of linen from one of the caves, indicated a dating of around 33 AD. Subsequent tests on the manuscripts themselves strongly suggested that most belonged to the last two centuries BC and the first century AD. Another method used to decipher the age of the manuscripts was paleographic dating, where scholars analyzed the shapes of letters or paleography. Scholars like Cross and Avigad applied this technique, dating fragments from 225 BC to 50 AD by examining the size, variability, and style of the text. Interestingly, when these fragments were later subjected to radiocarbon dating, the estimated range was between 385 BC and 828, meaning this method had an accuracy rate of 68%. The preservation of the Dead Sea Scrolls can be attributed to the dry and arid conditions of the Qumran area and the low humidity present near the Dead Sea. The scrolls stored in clay jars within the Qumran caves were further protected from deterioration. After confirming the reliability of these manuscripts, historians began to understand their importance, more specifically, their biblical significance. Before these manuscripts came to light, the oldest known manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible dated from the 10th century AD, such as the Aleppo Codex. Today, the oldest manuscripts of the Masoretic text, which form the basis of the Hebrew Bible, are from approximately the 9th century, but the Dead Sea Scrolls turn back the clock, advancing this timeline by an entire millennium to the 2nd century BC. According to Hebrew scholar Millar Burroughs, the discovery was a revelation of the unusual accuracy in the transmission of the biblical text over a thousand years. It shed light on the reliability of the current texts of the Old Testament, suggesting they are faithful copies of the original works, contrary to claims of alterations to the original text. Now let's examine some specific examples. Take, for instance, Isaiah 53, a chapter with only 17 letters in question. Of these, 10 are orthographic variations, 4 involve minor stylistic changes, and the remaining 3 affect the word light in verse 11, without significantly altering the meaning. This suggests that there is concrete evidence that these manuscripts indeed corroborate the reliability of the Bible and solidify the authenticity of the Bible as we know it today. According to Norman Geisler, a scholar and author with expertise in inerrancy, the Dead Sea Scrolls serve as compelling external evidence supporting the validity of the Masoretic text. His insights lead us to an important conclusion. The Masoretic text the basis for our modern copies of the Old Testament was preserved with exceptional precision over about a thousand years. That is, from the first century to the 900s AD. His confidence in this assertion stems from the Dead Sea Scrolls providing a unique glimpse into the past. Comparative studies, particularly focused on the Isaiah scroll, reveal a word-for-word -word identity in 95% of the text. Yes, you heard that right. Documents copied a millennium apart, yet maintaining an incredible similarity of 95%. This has to mean something. It can't just be a coincidence, right? And the fact is, Geisler isn't alone in his observations. Hebrew scholar Miller Burroughs in 1955 marveled at the limited changes the text underwent over approximately 1,000 years. As he himself said, herein lies its main importance, supporting the fidelity of the Masoretic tradition. So what does this mean for us today, living in the year 2024? It means we can travel back about 2,000 years just by flipping through the pages of the Isaiah scroll discovered by a young shepherd in a cave above the Dead Sea. Thus, we can almost certainly state that the Dead Sea scrolls, through their resemblance to the Masoretic text, provide an objective confirmation of the Bible's authenticity. And we cannot forget that the biblical significance goes beyond these similarities and differences. Among the 225 biblical texts found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, with the addition of deuterocanonical books, 
the number rises to 235. These cover parts of nearly all the books of the Tanakh of the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament canon. Among them are Psalms with 39 copies, Deuteronomy with 33 copies, Genesis with 24 copies, Isaiah with 22 copies, Jubilees with 21 copies, and Exodus with 18 copies. Overall, the high number of similarities and biblical text found in these manuscripts has convinced many historians of the accuracy of the Bible as we know it today. People also ponder the lost books of the Bible, seven lost books that are referenced within the Bible. The word Bible comes from the plural Biblia, meaning library. And the Bible is not one book, but rather 66 books. If you read three chapters every day and five on Sunday, you could finish in 12 months from today. Here's a small goal for you. Together, these books comprise a book of history, the history of our universe. But the Bible begins before and ends after any other recorded account, since it starts with the beginning of our universe and goes through to the end of our universe and even beyond. It's history written from God's perspective. Thus, he selects what is important to him, distinguishing it from political history, from the physical history of our universe. God carefully selects the things that matter to him, the events that affected him most deeply, setting it apart from all other histories. The story is long, and God, in his infinite wisdom, selected only the stories he deemed necessary for the Bible. The Bible was written over a period of about 1,500 years by some 40 different human authors. Kings, fishermen, priests, government officials, farmers, shepherds, and doctors were among the authors. This diversity results in an incredible unity, with common themes throughout the entire text, we know that God instructed the authors of the scriptures to incorporate passages from various extra-biblical sources when composing his word. Given that very few ancient books have survived to this day, such lost books are not uncommon, given the transitoriness of most writings. It's a testament to the miracle of the scriptures that the books of the Bible have done more than just survive. There are so many ancient copies that we can determine with great certainty what the original said. First, the Book of Jashar, also known as the Book of the Upright in Latin and the Book of the Righteous in Greek. The Book of Jashar was likely a collection or compilation of ancient Hebrew songs and poems, praising the heroes of Israel and their feats in battle. When the Lord stopped the sun in the middle of the day during the Battle of Gibeon, he mentioned the book of Jashar in Joshua 10 to 12 to 13. Second, the book of the wars of the Lord. The book of the wars of the Lord is one of several books referenced in the Bible that have now been completely lost. It is mentioned in Numbers chapter 21 to 14 to 15. Third, the book of Samuel the seer, the book of Nathan the prophet, and the book of Gad the seer. The Book of Gad the Seer is an ancient record of the life and reign of King David, mentioned in 1 Chronicles 29.29. 29. No copies of any of the actual books mentioned in Chronicles have survived, nor do we have copies of the other books cited here. Fourth, the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is any one of several pseudepigraphal, falsely attributed works. Texts whose claimed authorship is unfounded, works that are attributed to Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah, that is, Enoch, son of Jared, Genesis 5.18. According to the book of Genesis, Enoch is one of two people mentioned in the Bible who were taken to heaven without dying. The other person is Elijah. In verses 14 and 15, the biblical book of Jude includes a quotation from the book of Enoch. Jude draws this prophecy from the first book of Enoch. His authoritative use of a book that is not part of the canon raises some apparent questions. However, this does not prove that the book of Enoch is divinely inspired or that it should be included in the Bible. Jude's quotation is not the only one in the Bible that is taken from a source outside the Bible. 
Even though the works of Epimenides are referenced in Titus 1.12 by Apostle Paul, this does not indicate that we should lend his writings any greater weight of authority. The same applies to Jude verses 14 and 15. Although Jude uses passages from the Book of Enoch, it does not prove that all such passages are inspired or even accurate, and all it proves is that the verse in question is correct. We should approach the Book of Enoch and other similar works in the same way we approach other writings considered apocryphal. If you choose to study these works, it is essential to remember that they are not the divinely inspired and authoritative Word of God. Only the Bible is the divinely inspired and authoritative Word of God. Fifth, the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. Within the Book of Kings, references are made to the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel and the Chronicles of Judah. Sixth, the Chronicles of David, when Chronicles 27-24 references some chronicles or annals that have been lost over time. Seventh, the words of Shemaiah the prophet. In the second book of Chronicles, there's a reference to the book of Shemaiah the prophet, comparable to the visions of Iddo the seer. This book has been entirely lost to history, except by its title. God has given us a library of 66 books, it's no surprise, then, that many people approach the Bible questioning whether it truly contains the true words written centuries ago. The Dead Sea Scrolls show that this is true. We need to trust in God's Word, especially in these times, as these are the last days. The Bible is a history book, but it is unlike any other history book available in any public library. The Bible's history begins with the creation of the earth and ends with the end of the world. No other history book ever published covers such a broad range of events on planet Earth, partly because no one was present at the beginning to witness and document it, and thus no one can write about the beginning of our world with authority. We are the only people in the entire world who know how everything will end. That is unique. The Lord did not reveal the future to His followers to satisfy their curiosity. It was to prepare them for the future so that they would not be surprised when it arrived and so they would not misrepresent it. Let us be grateful that Jesus was so forthcoming in sharing what the future holds for us. People ask, are we in the end times? Yet the Bible speaks of the last days and we have been in the last days for 2000 years. The last days began at Pentecost where the first prophecy of the last days was fulfilled. Every Christian generation must live ready for the Lord's return. However, this does not mean waiting idly. The Bible is a book filled with forecasts. Its pages contain 735 predictions about the future. A prediction can be found in one out of every four chapters of the Bible from beginning to end. Essentially, it is a prophetic text, although some books focus more on predictions than others. 596 out of the 735 predictions have already occurred and literally came true, according to the prediction of the scriptures. Thus, 81% of all biblical prophecies have already been fulfilled, and some of these prophecies were made centuries before the events. It does not take much confidence to believe that the remaining 19% will also happen. This is a very high score. The Bible has proven to be 100% correct in all the predictions that could have been fulfilled up to now. Of the rest, the majority of them are related to the actual return of Jesus and what happens after that. How many of these predictions remain to be fulfilled before the return of Jesus? The answer is about 20, and we are watching to see these happen first, before we look for the Lord's return. God speaks and we can trust His Word. We can rely on God's Word to be true. In his writings, Paul uses the Greek term theopneustos to describe the nature of the Scriptures, meaning it is inspired by God or breathed out by God. This term appears only once in the entire Bible, emphasizing the uniqueness of God's Word. Just as God Himself, God's Word is eternal and will stand forever. Isaiah 48. God's word is immutable because it originates from God, who is truth. 2 Peter 1, 20-21.
We can trust that God, and therefore God's word is true. We can rely on God's word to impact our lives. Paul asserts that God's word is not only worthy of our trust, but also has practical benefits for our lives. According to Warren Wiersbe, a Bible teacher and commentator, God's word is valuable because it aids us in four ways. It teaches us what is right, doctrine, shows us what is wrong, reproof, guides us on how to correct our mistakes, correction, and instructs us on how to live righteously, instruction in righteousness. It's crucial to recognize that all of God's word is beneficial, not just certain parts of it. We can trust in God's word to prepare us for the mission. According to Paul, God's word has a purpose to fulfill in our lives. One of the most significant tasks for which God equips us as believers in Christ is to obey his commandment to make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28 to 18 to 20. Jesus came to them and said, all authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, helping people to learn about me, believe in me and obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance and on every occasion to the end of the age. The Bible is truly intended to reveal to us who we are through the eyes of God, our Creator. When we study the Bible and see a new image of ourselves, the responsibility is now ours to adjust where there are stains and dirt as we take the necessary steps to experience the image we have just seen. It's important to recognize that when we study the Bible, the Spirit of God has much to tell us and about us. Here are some images that the Bible paints of us that we also need to see clearly. The Bible lets you know that we are children of God. It paints a clear picture of born-again believers as God's children. Thus, it means that everyone can become his children as long as we are willing to say yes to his invitation in our hearts. The Bible lets you know that you are peculiar. God created everyone with fascinating and unique identities that are marvelous. Moreover, he chose us in salvation to be peculiar. We are all unique, and God wants us to often see this image of our peculiarity in the Bible. If we want to live life the right way, we must listen to and heed God's written word. The Bible gives us the standard by which we can differentiate truth from falsehood. It tells us about God. Having a wrong impression of God is to worship an idol or a false god. The Bible equips us to serve God. The Bible helps us know how to be saved from our sin and its ultimate result. Meditating on God's word and obeying its teachings will bring success in life. Joshua 1.8 This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. James 1.25 But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. God's word helps us see the sin in our lives and aids us in getting rid of it. It provides guidance in life, making us wiser than our teachers. The Bible prevents us from wasting years of our lives on something that doesn't matter and won't last. Matthew 7, 24, 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Reading and studying the Bible helps us see beyond the enticing bait to the painful hook in sinful temptations so we can learn from others' mistakes instead of making them ourselves. 
Experience is a great teacher, but when it comes to learning from sin, it's a terribly hard teacher. It's far better to learn from the mistakes of others. There are countless biblical characters to study, some of whom can serve as both positive and negative role models at different times in their lives. For example, David's victory over Goliath teaches us that God is greater than any challenge he places before us, while his succumbing to the temptation of committing adultery with Bathsheba shows how lasting and terrible can be the consequences of a moment's sinful pleasure. The Bible is not just a book to be read, it is a book to be studied so that it can be applied. Otherwise, it's like swallowing food without chewing and then spitting it back out. No nutritional value is gained from it. The Bible is God's word and his revelation of himself to us. It is as binding as the laws of nature. We can ignore it, but we do so at our own peril, just as we would if we ignored the law of gravity. It cannot be emphasized enough how important the Bible is to our lives. Studying the Bible can be compared to mining for gold. If we make little effort and just sift through the gravel in a stream, we'll find only a little gold dust. But the more we strive to really dig, the more reward we will gain for our effort. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before your grand presence, recognizing your infinite power that transcends time and space. On this journey of discoveries and revelations, Lord, you have shown us the immutable truth of your word through evidence that confirms the Holy Scriptures. Pour out, O Father, an anointing of wisdom and discernment upon us so that we may dive even deeper into the mysteries of your kingdom. Ignite our hearts with the fire of the Holy Spirit so that the light of your truth may illuminate our path and inspire us to ceaselessly seek your face. May this archaeological revelation not just be a milestone in our spiritual journey, but a sign of your love and your faithfulness, encouraging us to delve deeper into the hidden riches in your word. Grant us, Lord, the grace to be instruments of your power, carrying the message of your salvation to every corner of the earth. May every word spoken, every step taken, glorify your name, exalting your sovereignty over all creation. In the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns forever. Amen. Discover in the first comment our exclusive ebook on how to overcome challenges and live an abundant life that you need to know. Click now.